that are usually indicative of having some sort of you know good solid basalt uh, material you know originating with magma that was extruded out of the seafloor lava. Um, nice little coral promontory there. Yeah, this is a funny little island. Yeah. Just a lot of good stuff on it. Go for zoom. Let's see what we capture. But at the same time, uh, you know, we have a, you know, there's a good chance most of these rocks are tens of millions of years old. And so that's a lot of time for seawater to act on the rocky bottom. And when that happens, you typically have uh, seawater and microbes altering the composition of the rock uh, from within. And uh, that's something we looked at on our recent expedition just past. Uh, but it's neat because, you know, the rock, they ch physically change the composition of the rock uh, through alteration processes. So there might be different types of minerals that form over time. And then, of course, we're also interested in the crust of the rock itself, which, um, you know, has a, it's much less dense than okay, the go wide video. rocky substrate. But all this black surface on the rock is iron manganese oxides with other metals mixed in. Uh, those kinds of traces build up uh, from deposition, precipitation, out onto the rocky surface uh, over geologic time scales. So we're really trying to answer a bunch of different questions using a lot of different types of rocks in the seamount landscape. Like now we have a perfect view of this rock field. No more corals for a bit. But. What's going on with Argus again? Mm -hmm. A oh. new, a new metallogorgia colonies now. These uh, it just flickered. Chrysogorgid colonies that come up like a stalk and then branch out like an umbrella are in the genus Metallogorgia, like Go metal with two L's, and then G-O-R-G-I-A. They're part of the golden coral family. Oh yeah, look at that. Wow. It looks so and delicate. It, <laughs> and it looks like, yeah, they they have a also a characteristic ophiroid that kind of is with that coral colony okay, for life. Ahead. Everywhere in the ocean where we find Metallogorgia, uh, melanotrichos, this one species of coral, we always find this uh, brittle star associate everywhere in the world, the same species. Ophi really? Ophiocryas, yeah. Huh. Atlantic, Pacific, Light flickering everywhere. And that brittle star doesn't occur on any other what coral colony. Some light flickering again on the, I think one of the Like the, the truest of best friends mm -hmm. everywhere in the world. Mates for life. <laughs> Was that you think as the iris? Yeah, yeah, it's on steps. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I couldn't tell. I thought I s might have seen it flickering in the my utility cam, like the light. So it might have been one of my lights. It's been flickering a little bit. No, it just went away. It showed up for a sec. It. it I want to say it timed with the swell. It could be something maybe in a bottle that's loose. Uh, we've seen that before. But like it gets a little disturbed. But maybe I'm uh, biasing my thinking potentially. <laughs> I'll keep an eye on it. But these uh, red structures we're seeing, these animals on screen now, are a type of stalked crinoid. We saw a bunch of them last night, right? Yeah. Um, these are a different species, I think, than what we saw. All of these are called Proisocrinus ruberimus. The species name comes from their color, actually. Vibrant red.
or you lose track of like a little bit of your close quarters situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of it just comes with time, you know, like uh, all that sort of sort of seems like as you get more and more hours in the seat, then your 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 bit your kind of blinders sort of like open a bit and you start to take it all in. It's just it's just time and practice, you know. I think you're doing a fantastic job. And, you know, I'm here to point things out to you. That's I'm your backup, right? That's And it's only one technique, right? I guess not like it's the way, it's just a way to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Victor Gorgia is quite common here, actually. I'm seeing a good number of them. Well, the Metallogorgia. They seem to really like the current conditions in this slope. Oh, yeah. Totally. And especially when you have areas where you want to be low, Rage, but then you got to not, your objects are tall. It's tricky. Uh, you don't 50 meters bearing run over two them fives here. <laughs> after you're done looking at them. <laughs> Correction, bearing 255. Yeah, yeah, you know, it it happens, but Back you know. Uh, this black coral fan. Copy, thank you. Also, we were imaged of one of them earlier. Diversity still seems to be increasing. This site. Say again. Uh, did you keep the same bearing? Yes, I did keep the okay. same bearing. We are heading back up. Three five five. Yeah. Uh, science. So hopefully. Oh, hey, that's going to be tall. Whatever that is. Oh, it's a fish. That fish is very tall. <laughs> 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 it casts the same shadow as like a super tall bamboo coral. I thought it was coral as well. Yeah. The type of biomimicry. <laughs> <laughs> biomimicry. <laughs> nice. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> They're on to you, ROV pilots. Like, I, I, yeah, whenever I see that shadow, I want to back away. So it makes sense to cast that shadow to sit in front of the. The brow lights of Herc. What do they do next? Well, there's a bunch of things right here. Ah. Let's look at uh, that colony in the middle. Yeah, let's do it. Go for Zoom video. It's like a bit of a paragorgia, actually. Uh, paragorgia with a zoanthid, kind of the yellow uh, animal I mentioned lived in a semi-symbiosis with it. It's more like a parasite, parasite, but we seem to find the zoanthid doesn't quite kill the coral. Um, Except in rare cases where it's completely covered, but for the most part, it's always in this state of stasis where it kind of tends to be more commonly observed as living alongside uh, or as kind of like, kind of like a, I guess a roommate that doesn't pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just kind of uses your stuff in your space. Is there a little lobster inside the sponge? Oh, yeah. Tiny squat lobster. Yeah. Can you get it's a zoom full, on him? Full zoom right now. Oh, rats. Okay. Cool. Very nice, though. Okay. Go wide. Thank you, video. That was delightful. Nice fly. Thank you.
I like Dan's motto a lot, that the vehicle flies better when he doesn't touch it. <laughs> That's true. Uh, it knows what it's doing by itself. What's that? It knows what it's doing on its own. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I've done this before. You can so set it up for success and then take your hands off. Yeah. Everything goes great. Yeah. Is that the, the new semi-autonomous feature? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I always think of that there's this like scene in Forgetting Sarah Marshall where Paul Rudd's like, do less, do less. He's trying to teach him how to surf. Do less, do less. And then something goes horribly wrong. He's like, no, do more. <laughs> <laughs> sort of that balance, right? Okay. Onward. There's nice things to look at, but there'll be more of them. I'm always impressed by like some of these like super charismatic, beautiful colors that we see in this place that has zero light and no excuse for colors. It is pretty wild. And we, we don't really know a lot about coloration, right, Steve, or why these corals have are so colorful. Yeah, it's a, and it's a bit of a mystery. You know, there's some hypotheses out there that seem to have some, some traction, like, uh, you know, maybe the colors might represent volatile compounds or metabolites that the animal produces to protect against uh, predators um, that could give you know, coloration. Uh, it could also be some sort of vestige of their ancestors uh, you know, that they've retained. Oh, can we zoom on the pink steez, sir? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Go for zoom. Can we set up for a collection on that? Okay. Ooh. Sea star. Sure. That's Go wide. To be real quick. Yeah, this is gonna red, be... one tub of If it's a, uh, yeah. Only I only ask because we collected this last like crew. Yeah, go for we, it. And we lost it. Oh, oh, right, 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 right. I remember that. Actually, it was my fault that we lost it. So I was going to blame Dan, but you could take. No, it take was definitely me. Uh -huh. It was my sample that didn't get closed up properly. Uh, that's all right. So this is a potentially a new species of sun star, uh, Solasteridae, and we uh, we did collect it on the last cruise, but it fell out of the bio box. Um, it may have crept out of the bio box. Yeah. Devious little guy. Give it some credit. Yeah. They're pretty slow, but great. We can go into the forward box. Okay. Oh, we have a floaty thing in the forward can box. You come yeah. Can you retract your camera? Yes, I can. I need to do a few things here. Well, we can go in the starboard box then. Uh, I, I don't That's know if easier. I'd make it without crushing it. All right. If you're stable, go with the forward box and uh, throw it on the right-hand side. Uh, can we get some iris? Can you open the box? Yep. There's a tiny little floaty in there. I think if you do it slowly, it'll stay down. Yeah. See okay. when you've got enough there. There we go. Oh. He's in a fight for his life. Hold on a sec. There you go. Thank there you very much. So that was sample 18, right? 18, yeah. So a type of sun star, Solasteridae. A uh, nice Josh. potential new species that had been observed in this area but never properly identified. So our uh, sea star experts ashore will be thrilled about that one. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. You've redeemed yourself. Yeah, Josh, is... Josh redeemed me. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. All teamwork. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we haven't made it to the surface yet. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you got to scoot a little bit now. Though. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It's a little scooting. It was worth it. Yes, very much so. So what? It, like you caught that immediately. You're like, yes, that's the one. Yep. What? What makes it so special? Uh, you know, there's not that many pink sun stars down here. Okay. So that, that was kind of like the first thing that triggered my memory. Um, you know, there, there's lots of starfish down here, but the ones with more than, you know, five arms kind of stick out. Okay. Yeah. So Sunstar is one with more than five arms, and then they're mostly another color. Yeah, uh, typically, uh, not necessarily. The color is super variable, but the ones, um, this particular one in this region, is uh, always kind of pinkish 
rose colored. Okay. Well, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, we we like half closed. We we closed the box, but left like a little crack in it, I guess. Yeah. And I like to think it crept out. I think they're pretty devious. Yeah. No, I think it absolutely did. I think that was good on its part. Yeah, because like we didn't. It would have flown out when we put that rock in. We would have seen it. And yet, we did not. Well, I've had. I made the mistake one time of collecting like a squid worm or some. Uh -huh. Swimming animals yeah. in the suction jar, Bridge, yeah. Staff. And then I didn't turn the jar. The oh, and it, it it swam out it the jar, out. out the hose, and did you out see the it? Yeah, it felt like swim out. I'm like, oh my god, so, so yeah. Upset. I feel like I heard that eel pouts do that too. Yeah, it was pretty. Five zero like, meters, uh, two five five. Yep, back to flush. Rookie mistake. Yeah, the uh, I think that's happened with octopods before. Yeah, We've sampled in the slurp. Yeah. Uh, I recall on this ship that happening once, but yeah, they're they're smart. A yeah. Gumbo. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're just like following currents, right? They're look, they're probably looking for. They're just looking for wherever the current's coming from. Maybe I don't know. Because they're really not smart. They've got some sort of like decision making software going. Yeah, they've they, each of, each of their arm tips has sensory structures, so they can kind of kind of like a Doppler, you yeah. know, uh, sensory structures. They can sense, uh, you know, food signals, for example, or smell food signals uh, using differences in in the sense, senses on their arm tips. Potentially oxygen too, because you're in this little jar, you're using up the oxygen, and then yep. oh, there's oh, oxygen no this way. Uh, <laughs> Go that oh. way. Oh, that's oh, yeah. really interesting. Like I a didn't think of that. breath of fresh air in that direction. Yeah. Huh. Oh, that's. I don't actually give any thought to how these creatures breathe. Like corals, presumably use oxygen, right? Or do they use? Yeah, they use yeah. oxygen. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That it, it's a significant effect on their distribution for sure. Um, there's a, a saying by a, a scientist in Italy, uh, Marco Taviani, who was, uh, gave a talk at a conference, and he gave a really great talk about the role of oxygen, particularly in the Medi Mediterranean, uh, on deep water corals. And he always used to say that oxygen is not very democratic. You can't, <laughs> can't get around it. It's, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Low oxygen, can't breathe, can't live. Right. And that may be fine for microbes, for, for all the megafauna down here, they really need oxygen. So what does it take to breathe as a coral? Um, what's the minimum concentration we typically find them at? Oh, no, I mean, like, what are the structures? Like, like physiologically, what are the structures of breathing as a coral? Um, so they, they do all their gas exchange across their uh, membranes, so all the tissue, the soft tissue. Okay. Um, so they don't have specialized re um, gas exchange structures like gills or anything like that. It's just all across the membranes. And most organisms have just that as, a, as their gas exchange function. Uh, sponges as well. Um, see, is there anything in the frame here that doesn't use uh, gaseous diffusion? I don't think so. I really want this iridogorgia view down the spiral. I can never seem to get it. Trevor can get it. Steve, we're reaching the summit. Do you have an idea if you want to go check out that north summit or head uh, towards waypoint 11 in the southern summit? Um, I think we're going to go towards the, the actual summit, the waypoint 11 area. Okay. Yeah, and kind of do with that on a transect. Yeah. Kate, would you want to do a reset for me? Oh, of course I, am I do. <laughs> free of autos. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. There was a cool little patch there down into the to the right, just like a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Must have just been like there was a good spot to connect to attach to there cuz this is all not so great. Do crustaceans get their oxygen through soft tissue as well, or do they have any special structures? No, they often do have gills uh, or uh, structures resembling gills. 
yeah, usually internal to their anatomy. Uh, sea stars uh, also they they take in water um, through pores in their body. Can we zoom on this uh, anthemastus uh, mushroom coral right here? Yeah, totally. Go for zoom. This actually looks um, like a distinct species of anthemastus. I'm not sure. Uh, there's a couple species of anthemastus or pseudoanthemastus that have very very long stalks uh, or um, pedestals. Uh, and then kind of a ball of polyps on the end. But I was under the impression that that species had a more southerly distribution. But uh, we can get some imagery of this and send it off to our mushroom coral experts. Yeah, that's better. Great. Yeah, another yellow sea fan, Acanthogorgia, top. Nice botryoidal crusts. One of the bubbly okay, go textures. Away. There's a, some pretty good. Some other good stuff here. Yeah. Was that a good enough shot of that? Yes. Yeah. Actually. Okay. So, Steve, when we bring this D star sample to the top, you know, we're going from 1,800 meters uh, to our ship. Is there any impact of the pressure on that sea star? Will it be alive? Viewers are wondering, will it be alive when it reaches the surface? It will most likely be alive, yeah. Um, with a lot of the organisms that we collect, uh, they're not really um, subject to, you know, the pressure does change, but physiologically, they may not be experiencing changes due to the pressure. Um, more than likely, if they do experience any stress, it's probably due to changes in temperature. Mm, um, but for the most part, the boxes seal very well. So they're essentially in water that is native to where they were collected huh. uh, down here. So around 2 degrees C or so. What are we at now for temperature? 2.4. Er. Yeah, so you can imagine going from a very stable, you know, year-round temperature of 2.4 degrees C up to close to 30 degrees C it is quite the temperature yeah. shock. I, Definitely. Yeah, I would do it now. Just keep the ship on that side of the ridge. Ridge, no? Like jumping from an ice bath into a hot shower. Can we move 100 meters bearing 210? Thank you. So there's a few ways that those animals would compensate for that stress. Um, you know, animals that have gas sinuses or gas cavities, like fish swim bladders, for example, might uh, be more susceptible to barotrauma, we call it. Hmm. You know, trauma uh, resulting from pressure differences. But uh, not not these animals that we have collected so far. I was in Alaska this summer in Southeast Alaska um, in this area where there's really intense upwelling. And so as the current would kind of hit the shore, a lot of these deep sea fish, especially rockfish, would you know get sucked up to the top. And then because of that barotrauma, they would just like balloon out. Mm -hmm. So it was like, crazy because you'd just be kind of zooming around in the water and just see these ballooned up rockfish but it was like a yeah. feeding fest for bald eagles and all sorts of other predators but wow. you could kind of just like see how that would happen it was pretty crazy We've got some viewers wondering about our green lasers and how far apart those are. Those are 10 centimeters, so those are really helpful for us to measure or get an idea of how big or small anything is that we're looking at down here. We can also use them post-dive during our analysis of the video 
uh, or our scientists ashore that do the video analysis, you can actually determine the area that you're looking at in a mm. camera frame by doing some math uh, to get a width of the frame field of view and then calculate the length based on your dive track. Hmm. So you can get a density of animals, which is something we, as we scientists think is uh, very useful for comparing you know, one site to one site because you're comparing density to density. I think we're kind of on the on the summit track now, which is really neat. We're still seeing lots of corals, but the sediment buildup is pretty substantial. Um, oftentimes, you never know what you're going to get on the tops of seamounts. Sometimes they're sediment covered, sometimes they're scoured. Uh, but the sediment here is you know, reasonably uh, it, it has some reasonable reasonable thickness in it because you can actually see some traces um, of infauna. So animals that live in the sediment and they create burrows or trails sometimes and they'll you know make a burrow you know ex excavate uh, bits of sediment and create a pile next to their burrow yeah you can see it really well kind of on the left those little mm -hmm. go for zoom there's like a little tiny creature sticking out of the sediment yeah good eye oh wow little, is that a sea pen or is that a worm or what do you think that is oh that is a sea pen Oh, okay. Yeah, I, it's not one I'm familiar with, actually. Kind of a unique sea pen, actually. He's so wee. Like, really tiny. Yeah. Okay, is that good for... Do you have some imagery yeah, of that? that? He's, that, like, that's great. a little bit folded over. He doesn't really... He's a little camera shy. So, this is a good time to kind of talk about the seamount landscape and why animals occur where they do. Um, you know, we assume that seamounts are, you know, these volcanoes are old and full of hard rock, but you know, there there's there is sediment accumulation. Depending on the, what the currents are doing at the bottom, uh, sediment is falling from you know sources out in the sea. Here, um, we're not near any land masses that produce appreciable, appreciable amounts of sediment. So it's not coming from the continents, it's coming from shells of animals that have lived up in the plankton. Can you give me an Argus head died, on two And then their shells drift down mm -hmm. and accumulate, forming these test sediments. Things like foraminifera, uh, radiolarians, coccolithophores, all of those things um, produce these types of sediments that accumulate here. But the sediments themselves are actually habitat for a lot of animals. In the, uh, in the sea mount, as well as the sea pens. We saw a lot of sea pens have limited habitat requirements, but sediment is sometimes one of them, so they can anchor in with their peduncle. And then others, uh, like the rock pens, are able to you know, more easily attach the rock surfaces. But you know, it, it's, it's kind of like a mosaic. Uh, if you can imagine you know, a quilted blanket or mosaic um, of different types of composition of species. As you move across, you see similar patterns, but each one is slightly different based on what the substrate characteristics are in that, in that area. Ah, oh, there's a big coral over there. Yeah, there is. Oh, wow, it's old. This is, there's a lot of current here. I mean, not a lot, but relative to what we've been seeing recently. Mm -hmm. And so I bet this is a, just a great place to grow up as a coral. Yeah. <laughs> Raise the kids. <laughs> oh my gosh, Look at wow. That. Oh my wow. gosh. It's got that one extra tall branch. I know. That is tall. That is huge. You yeah. can zoom video? Wow, that's incredible. This is the. Looks to be a. Uh, Tell it's old. It has, it's like the the nodes of the bamboo coral. The black uh, proteinaceous part of the coral is being overgrown by the calcareous part. Uh, usually, that means that they just get so so old and ancient they just overcalcify themselves. Is that a little sea spider? Can we try zooming on Argus as well? See if we can get the uh, relative size there. 
someone say something about a sea star on them? I thought I saw a sea sp tiny spider. Sea oh, spider. yeah. Those are also predators. You'll see them once in a while. This one looks like it could be a J-clade um, bamboo coral. Either the same genus or related to a coral called Jason Isis, named after the ROV. Okay, let's go wide and skedaddle. That is gorgeous. That's two ROVs you just said there. Jason yeah. and Isis. <laughs> two different ROVs. There you go. They're both, they're both <laughs> Herx. I wonder if that was They're planned. both Herx, like, closest relatives, too. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, is there a phylogenetic tree? Of, yeah, totally. Of ROVs? Yes, there is. <laughs> there absolutely is. So what's the earliest common ancestor for an ROV? <laughs> <laughs> the earliest common ancestor for those ROVs, I think, is Alvin. Ooh. Who still lives? Not a toad camera. No, like uh, the for the engineering, like the actual guts, the software, everything like that. I, I huh. want to say that's the. I could be wrong, but I think those are the com. I think that's the common ancestor. Did you all see the submersible at port in Honolulu? No. Yeah. It, it was in that warehouse, and they had the garage door up. I think it was one of the, the Pisces subs. No kidding. Yeah. Huh. It was big. Uh, it looked big. Is everyone okay if I turn off the Argus camera temporarily? I'm okay. Okay with me. All right. Yep. Okay. That's pretty high drama there. Yeah, this is when people downstairs start freaking out. I know. Yep. I think I've seen this show before. Everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's fine. Uh. Yeah, cleared 4.9. Yeah. That would be a really neat, neat piece for the website would be to okay. track the Back development on. of ROVs over time, how we arrived at our current generation. A lot of it, I think, comes from, um, like, the, the origin, like, in the largest sense, comes from the beginnings of the Cold War when we were trying to get um, code books out of sunken Russian subs. So sort of the the initiation of needing to be able to operate on the seafloor very very deep without like the human limitations. Yeah. That's cool. I never heard about that. Yeah, me neither. Highly recommend Blind Man's Bluff. It's basic. It's the story of um, submarines in the Cold War, but it definitely makes very apparent that the Cold War is the reason that we have the tech we do to do this science. It's a super amazing read. Yeah. Really nice summit community. I think we've seen more Victor Gorgia here at this site than any other seamount in the past cruise. Phenomenal. Metallogorgia as well. Really a unique summit community. You know, these are species we see all over the area, but just like the composition is um, zoom video pretty unique here. See how they attach just little tiny pedestals. Yeah, it's all covered with tissue too, all the way down to the base. Acanthogorgia colonies, some black corals as well. Nice botryoidal crust textures. We'll be looking for a rock okay, um, kind of closer to waypoint 11, kind of at the end of this summit transect. Copy. Okay. Somewhere around 1,800 meters. But I, I think I don't think it should be too difficult to find a rock in this. Can you say that again? Can you point away a point eleven for me? Yeah, it's just off the screen. Okay. So I have this one highlighted right here at the top, and then yeah. my point eleven is just right there. Okay. So. Great. I bet you, right at that targeted waypoint, we're going to find just like the perfect rock sitting right on top of the sediment. <laughs> nice and proud. <laughs>
angular and crusty, like everyone <laughs> satisfies, checks all boxes. So if we find an angular one that is crusty, is that something that Andrea can use t to date and we can use uh, for Coralie's crust study? Theoretically, but I don't think such a crust and angular rock exists. I'm just trying to be optimistic. <laughs> it's appreciated. Yeah. So usually angular means that it's freshly broken off of something uh, on the seafloor and Right. You know, kind of crusty and rounded usually means it has really thick crusts on it. <laughs> uh, so those two things are sometimes in competition. So what's the the current flow seems to be coming now kind of from the northwest again. There's some uh, coral carnage here a little bit, like just some downed down trees. Yeah, you know, the, the current again, I think it's swapped back to the northwest coming over the top of the seamount. It, yes, I agree. So it, it seems strong. So I would suspect, you know, it's not something easy for a coral to fight against once it gets so large. Can we take a look at the this um, this one right here? Yeah. Kind of candelabra shaped. Kalani? Yeah. That'll be it. That'll something. be a new record, I think, for this dive. I haven't seen any of these yet. Uh, this is called a uh, bamboo coral. Uh, typically, we'd have, we would have called this uh, Isadella, but now it's in a clade called I4. Um, but this one has a very distinctive branching pattern, uh, and it's actually, uh, I think it's there's a couple of new species that might be coming out that with this kind of morphology. But it's a okay, go very on. Very neat. See that here? Image it. Did you get what you needed there? Yeah, that's data? enough. Yeah. Great. Oh, you got good. Got it. Definitely tell me if those like captures come out blurry because I'm just moving too much. I've seen like captures definitely come out blurry when I move too much. And then I'm sure you can't see polyps or whatever it is you need to see in them. Yeah, no, you're, you're doing a great job so far. Okay. okay. Bridge, now. Can we move one zero zero meters bearing two one zero? And just in the last few Roger. seconds, we've started to get a lot of corals popping back into the community, increasing yep. the diversity. So this is definitely a hot spot. Definitely a high current area. So I'm, ha yeah, it's, it seems like it's about due west. Or coming from the west, I should say. Get to fight against it, or is it pretty? Oh yeah, I can fight. Um, so I'm gonna, so we're gonna go downhill for a little while. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna wait for Argus to catch up a little bit, so it's not doesn't end up too much above 
perk, but also very close to the bottom. Um, sort of like the perfect storm there. So when Argus catches up a little bit, then it becomes, then I'll just sort of descend facing like angled to the slope. Shouldn't be too long of a slope. No. Science, are you able to see what you need from up here? Or do you want me to come down farther? Yeah, this is all right. Um, I can do better, probably. There. Much better. One of our scientists ashore wants to know where our current meter went. Oh, it's in the shop. He's in talking shop. about the uh, the weird um, rake doll thing. <laughs> is that what he's talking about? Is that yeah. what your science yeah. he or she is talking about? Yes. That's really funny. To the shop. Currents coming from the northwest. Very strange how we had that layer of south southeasterly current for a while. Yeah, totally. And it underlines the. Yeah, that it's it's really dependent on the uh, slope. I think because the slope was to the southeast when we saw it that way. Mm -hmm. Bubblegum or precious? Or something else? Take a look. How, okay, I actually don't know how to distinguish. I remember you said before, but I was so busy trying to keep it in frame that I didn't actually catch. Give me a zoom. You can go further, I think. It'll stay. One looks like a. Any thoughts? A what? Any thoughts? Precious um, coral. Guesses. Actually, a bubblegum coral, Paragorgia. Yeah, it's a. It's got more of these kind of lobate, uh, blobby, uh, textures to the. Okay, go wide. To the. Uh, Coral more, colony. More lobate, more blobby. Yeah, I mean, Roger. it's hard to tell. It's hard to show you that with the polyps being open like that. Oh, okay. But um, oh, that's right. You said that it it helps to have the polyps closed. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the base too, you can see uh, some differences in how they attach and what the base looks like. Also, you don't typically get. You know, very rarely do I see. Uh, Asteriskimatid uh, brittle stars, so the, the brittle star that was on there on precious coral, they usually prefer the Paragorgia or the, the softer coral colonies. Okay. Um, 
So that sometimes is a giveaway. And this is a from Noid? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it might be uh, another Primnoid. I think it's Paracolyptrophora. One we've been seeing uh, for a little bit now, but very large, impressive colony. And my mystery uh, Stillinifer in there, white unbranched or white branched uh, stalk, but it's actually a, an imposter. It's a coral that overgrows other corals' stalks. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, man, I wish I had gotten a better <laughs> view of that. That sounds amazing. Yeah, we got a piece of it on the last cruise. Okay. And uh, it was very, very elusive for a few dives, but we managed to get a grab of it. Oh, we made it down that hill with no drama at all. That was great. Well done. You too. That was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long is the downhill going to last? Yeah. The things to think about add up quickly. Another tiny little island of friends. I love those little mushroom corals so much. That one, uh, that anemone kind of looked like a Corella morpharian, uh, which is a anemone relative, but they typically have knobby or knobby tentacles. Uh, that's one way to tell them apart. And then the knobs are typically loaded with nematocysts more so than in a typical anemone. So very potent thing. See, we have a viewer who was um, trying to remember the name of that really delicate pink umbrella-like coral we saw earlier. Uh, so the probably on this watch, I'm guessing. Yeah, it was like um, maybe an hour ago. It yeah, was that, like the one of, came of off it? like a thin stalk, and then it kind of umbrella on top. I think that's what they're yeah. talking about. I I can like picture it. It almost looked like there were lots of little like dots kind of yeah. on top. That, that's, I'm pretty sure that's Metallogorgia. That sounds, yeah, I think yeah. that's what you had said then. Thank you. Metallogorgia. Another glass sponge. The macaroni? <laughs> yeah. I like that one. Hey, what was the report there? Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, we had a rock star dive here. 
the four to eight. Yeah, Trevor and Antonella, they, I mean, I can try, but they had a pretty blue water intensive last cruise too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I can't say that for sure. Zoom at the branch point on this tall bamboo. Yeah, totally. Okay, start zooming in video. All right. Good. Perfect. Right there. Fantastic. Okay. okay. Go wide. Oh, man. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. Yeah, I think we moved through a bit of a saddle. That kind of had uh, more rubbly bits. We're picking up again the other side. So, Steve, what's this um, this macaroni sponge? It's not the Brussels sprout one. It's the <laughs> macaroni one. Just to draw a sharp distinction here, right in the center of the screen. Yeah. I'll have to look that one up. I actually don't know. Oh, there's a really bizarre purple fan off to the right. Is that also Victor Gorgia? Can we check that out first? Uh, off to the right. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. While we do that, I, I got a good image of the last macaroni sponge, and I'll get you a okay. better idea on that. But that purple one on the right, I just want to check if it's Victor Gorgia or maybe something else. Roger. It seems a bit more rounded than the other ones we've seen. Yeah. Yeah, Victor Gorgia is like sort of hap grows sort of haphazardly. It, it, yeah, so the this group was recently revised, uh, Victor Gorgia and um, Anthothela, the Anthothela Day family. They're very closely related, um, but some of the colonies of the Anthothela family are brambly, and so sometimes Victor Gorgia can look a little brambly if it's not in a like a ideal perfect orientation. Go for zoom. Float above this already, Gorgia this here. It. Yeah, I think it is Victor Gorgia as well. But good to check and confirm that. I don't have it perfectly lit. Do not squish the other coral. Okay, go wide. Do you think you have what you need, or should I yeah, sit down? Yeah, I think it's enough. Yeah. Okay. Cool little yellow again. Yeah, 
Yeah, there's definitely a lot of life in here. Now. We're ready to make another move, 100 meters, bearing to one zero. Thank you. What is his move speed? Uh, 0 0.2 knots. Okay, that's why our, our layback is significantly less than it was yep. in the middle of the night. It was awesome. Yeah, I'm liking this setup. Yeah, totally. He's m making his moves really easy as well. I didn't catch that. Say again. It, yep, 0 0.2 knots. Dark. Thank you. Oh, it's another bathypathies with the uh, Europtychus crab. Go for zoom. The big, this one. Yeah, the, the, the large black coral. Yep. Oh, yeah. Kind of make out, if you, see the, if you saw the base, uh, the black skeleton with a kind of reddish tissue on top. And then the, the squat lobster there is probably Europtychus, a new species. Very spiny. So why, okay, that particular squat lobster hangs out on that particular black coral. Yep. That's just the way it is. Yep. He doesn't like to hang out anywhere else. Nope. Huh. Okay, go wide. So yeah, there's a, a there's a very interesting relationship between corals and associates, and we've been working for a number of years to try and uh, try and describe some of the patterns uh, that associates have with corals in tropical environments because the diversity is quite high. Um, for deep water corals, but also for their associates, brittle stars, crinoids, um, sea star predators, for example, sometimes. And uh, it just seems like they're quite the associates are quite picky. Yeah, it's um, yeah we we call it fidelity. So typically, the deeper you go, the greater fidelity there is of hmm. associates to certain species. Okay. And the shallower you go. Uh, the, the, that relationship starts to break down um, and you typically have everybody on everyone else uh, type of okay. patterns. Um, or, you know, it's, it's not as picky. So if you have fidelity between an associate and a coral, let's say there isn't, you know, you see one coral and then the not next coral is very far away from it. Is that associate living most of its life then on, I guess, how do you get like the spread of the associates? Yeah. Knowing so, that these are so kind of like sparsely scattered sometimes across. Yeah, I, it depends on, um, it depends on the size of the coral sometimes. Uh, you know, larger coral colonies will have multiple associates and usually with 